I'm Satish. I work for Microsoft. Today in this presentation, I'm going to talk about developing fault tolerant systems using this Pi soft code. So here is the motivation of this work. Safety critical systems must be designed to be fault tolerant to provide safety, security, and reliability and as well as availability. But unfortunately, semiconductor devices are susceptible to single event offsets and it makes the system design a challenge. Today, safety critical systems are reaching sophisticated levels of complexity and this, these systems are heavily rely on software that runs on embedded processors. So, the key element that needs to be protected from single event upsets is the processor. So we need methodologies for fault detection and correction in the processor without impacting the performance. So let's talk about single event upsets. The single event upsets are radiation induced faults that alters the state of the memory elements in the system. As you can see the picture here, when you expose the semiconductor device to the radiation, there will be some charged particle that hits the device and these charged particles leave some charged particles in the depletion layer of the transistor. Because of this charged particles, there will be change in the state of the transistor that creates the errors in the memory elements. And these single event upsets are transient in nature. Which means these are not permanent faults. So if you rewrite the memory element with the new data, it gets corrected and your system can be restored. But if you have upsets in the control logic, it may change your uh, behavior of the system. So we need to deal with these single event upsets. The single event upset used to be a concern for only aerospace applications where we have more radiation. But nowadays, these upsets are becoming a major concern for ground level, ground level applications as well. And it is because of decrease in the core voltages and decrease in the transistor geometry and increase in the switching speeds. And this single event of such sort of reality in communication and automotive industries. If you uh, look at a few years back, Cisco found failures in their router. And after uh, failure analysis, they found that the failure was because of the single event of such. And similarly, there was a failure in uh, automotive industry uh, for a specific model in Toyota uh, cars. Uh, there was a failure uh, because of single event of such. So we need to deal with these single event upsets when you are designing safety critical systems. So what are the different fault detection techniques that are commonly used for detecting the faults from the single event upsets? So one of the techniques is using the self-test libraries. So these self-test libraries are exhibited by the processor along with your application. So when you are executing your application, it calls the self-test library periodically and it checks the state of the processors uh, for the correctness and if it finds some uh, discrepancy in the processors, then it will alert the system manager for corrective action. So but because of the self-test libraries needs to be run periodically, it consumes the processor bandwidth so that it limits your application performance. Another technique is Lockstep processor. So in this lockstep processor architecture, we have two uh, similar identical processors that execute the same application in lockstep. As you can see in the figure, uh, we can have two RISPI processors here that run in the lockstep, and we can have a comparator that compares the address and data that is resulting from the both the processors. So with this comparison, with this comparison comparator, we can compare the uh, outputs of both processor and detect the errors in the processor. With this long set processor, we can achieve fault fast error detection and without impacting the processor performance. 
because you can see we are not making any changes to the processor here. We are just adding an extra comparator outside the processor which compares the results of the processor. We can increase the reliability of this uh, long side processor architecture by adding uh, 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 temporary redundancy uh, by using delayed long side uh, structure. So, in this delayed long side uh, architecture, we provide delays at the input of one of the processors and uh, we delay the output of another processor so that you know we can compare the results of the both processor with the comparator. So, with this uh, redundancy in time, we can avoid the we can reduce the probability of uh, a single event upset affecting the both the processor at the same time. And we can also have redundancy in sp uh, space. So we can separate these two codes uh, uh, with a good amount of uh, 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 space between them. And this space separation will uh, give you the prob less probability uh, for affecting uh, uh, the processors at the same time. So, once we detect the fault, so what are the different mechanisms for recovering the system from the fault? So, one of the techniques is to reset the system. So, this is very simple, uh, but uh, it is going to uh, restart the complete application and it will execute the application from the beginning. So, it will have long recovery delay. Another thing is switching the system to a safe state. When you find a fault, you, uh, you bring the system into safe state. This is called fail safe operation, and this is more common in uh, auto uh, applications. Another te technique is called rollback through checkpointing. So, in this technique, we are basically uh, saving the processor context, and then whenever there is a fault, uh, uh, we switch back to previous state, previous error in state. So this technique saves the uh, execution time because uh, we are not switching back to the uh, starting of the application, we are switching back to the uh, error tree uh, state. It can be implemented uh, in both software or hardware. If you, if you want to implement the software, you have to have a separate uh, function for uh, saving this context uh, and uh, it is going to basically uh, affect your uh, real-time applications. So, this software based checkpointing is not a solution for uh, real time applications. We can implement this checkpointing and rollback in hardware that gives you faster recovery and it suits your real time applications as well. So, now coming to the advantages of RISPI processor for designing safety critical systems. The major advantage is open source licensing. So, this Licensing provides you the flexibility to make changes uh, in the processor for your safety critical requirements, such as you can implement memory protection for your memories using uh, single bit error correction and dual bit error detection mechanisms. You can have you can protect your bus pages using error correcting codes. <coughs> You can apply block level hardware redundancy uh, using error detection and corruption techniques. For example, uh, you, uh, you can have uh, dual modular redundancy applied to your uh, AAU. And you can go for selective hardening. So, this selective hardening is about applying uh, triple modular redundancy technique for uh, selective blocks. So, if you find one of the block is more uh, susceptible for uh, single limit upset, you can go for the selective hardening so that it will not uh, uh, reduce your performance uh, uh, drastically. Or you can implement this checkpointing and go back using uh, hardware techniques. You can make some changes to the processor uh, to basically uh, save the context periodically and have some logic to roll back to the uh, previously stored values. And we can optimize the logic for performance as well. And it has accessible ISA. And it provides the portability. So once we have the uh, RTL and we can port from one uh, device to one entry into a different entry chip. And uh, another thing is uh, security. So, 
So we can we can uh, uh, inspect the source code uh, to uh, basically uh, identify the uh, threads in the source code. So uh, because of this uh, source code availability, uh, it builds the trust. Okay, so now we need to have a fault tolerant platform for implementing the safety critical systems. So everything is uh, very attractive in safety critical uh, applications because of uh, low development uh, time and low development cost compared to the assets. And they are very flexible. You can implement your custom uh, logic. But uh, the single event upset susceptibility varies from FPGA technology to FPGA technology. So in FPGAs, we have two types of uh, memory elements. One set of memory elements are used for storing the FPGA configuration data. Another set of uh, memory elements are used for uh, uh, used for your resistors, used for your logic. So we need to uh, protect these two memory elements from single event upsets. If you look at SMFPGAs. So in SMFPGAs, the configuration data is stored in the SM cells. And these SM cells are susceptible to single event upsets. So we, we, if you have, uh, if you have uh, upsets in the configuration, then you need to reprogram the uh, SMFPGA to recover the device. So that will increase the recovery time. Another type of FPGA is the anti-fuse FPGA. So in this anti-fuse FPGA, the routing configuration is equal to single event upsets. Okay, and uh, it has single event upset card in uh, flip flops, which are used for your logic, and it has a single event upset in your uh, uh, clocks. The downside of this FPGA is it is one time programmable. Another variant is radiation tolerant flash based FPGAs. So in this radiation tolerant flash based FPGAs, the routing configuration is immune to the single event upsets and it has uh, hardened deep clocks and clock sources and it is reprogrammable. Another type is flash based FPGAs. So here the configuration is immune to the single event upsets and it is reprogrammable. So the flash based FPGAs are uh, uh, <coughs> a little cheaper than other uh, radiation tolerant and anti fuse FPGAs. So, anti fuse FPGAs are the most common uh, FPGAs used for safety, critical, and machine critical applications. But nowadays, the flash based FPGAs are becoming more popular for safety critical applications because of single event upset immunity, single event upset protected block ramps, and they have built in self test mechanisms, so you can run the self-test mechanisms on demand to check the configuration of the uh, device or your uh, logic and they provide a design separation methodologies for spatial redundancy so you can have this technique to separate your uh, logic with enough distance between them to create a spatial redundancy and they provide uh, very good security so if you look at a flash based FPGAs, uh, they provide uh, design security uh, for uh, security of design and uh, they provide data security for protecting the runtime data. So the security and reliability are related. Suppose uh, if your system is not secure, there is a chance of compromising the reliability of the system. So security is also important, important for building the safety critical systems. So they provide secure boot uh, mechanisms, so you can uh, boot the risk file processor securely, and they are reprogrammable. And these are based on flash technology, so uh, they are lightweight power up, so you don't have to depend on external components to configure the uh, FPGAs like SM FPGAs, and they are low power. So flash based FPGAs or the ideal platform for implementing the safety critical systems. So as a summary, semiconductor devices are susceptible to the single event upsets and we need to basically have countermeasures to uh, deal with the single event upsets. And most of the safety critical systems are depending on the processors 
and we need to protect the processors from single event upsets. So we we need to uh, have some uh, architecture that gives you a fault detection capability uh, that can be this uh, lock set processor technique, and we can have we can make the uh, uh, locks uh, we can we can make the processor as fault tolerant by implementing uh, some error correcting and uh, memory protection techniques inside the processor. That's where RISPY processor gives uh, uh, advantage because of its open source licensing. And uh, we have flash based FPGAs, uh, which provides the uh, CPU limit offset immunity and uh, uh, reliability features for implementing your system. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm Jin Wang from Tatum University, and I have a question about the hardware checkpoint. Uh, I want to know how frequently they should be the checkpoint. As we know, SEO will happen every second in the processor. So, to avoid the single event steps, should we uh, set the checkpoint frequency? Uh, maybe every cycle. Otherwise, the error date may be writing into the uh, cache of memory. We will use last part the Python. Uh, sorry, can you repeat your question? I repeat your question. Uh, I mean, uh, a single event step will happen maybe every cycle. Right. Um, maybe you should set the checkpoint frequently. Otherwise, maybe this cycle it happened uh, to the upside, but you didn't set checkpoint. Right. Then uh, it will be right into the cache or memory. Yeah. So uh, the frequency of this checkpoint is very important. So if you uh, if you have a long duration between the uh, checkpointing, so by the time you checkpoint your uh, processor resistor, you might have basically captured the error states. So we need to have uh, 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 optimum level uh, for this checkpointing because if you do this checkpointing very often, it is going to affect your processor performance. I mean, application performance. So based on the application requirement and the environment, uh, I mean, uh, uh, environment in the sense, uh, the average error rate that is uh, possible in the environment based on these uh, two uh, things, you have to basically uh, decide the frequency of checkpointing. And if you implement this checkpointing at the processor level, uh, that means if you go uh, at the instruction level, uh, if you after executing the instruction, if you can if you if you can save the state, then it gives you a very good uh, check, uh, very good uh, um, uh, uh, reliability because uh, you are uh, checkpointing the processor resistors at a very short intervals of time. Hi, uh, Dan Lustig from NVIDIA. Uh, so I have a question about your error detection as it related to memory in particular. Um, so if you, uh, so you can't replay a store twice, you can't just overwrite something that might have happened, especially in multi-core context. And likewise for loads, if you replay a load twice, then you might actually just get different values because it's non-deterministic. Um, and so I was just wondering if you thought about this in a multi-core context or if you're protecting memory or just not protecting memory in the same uh, way. Thanks. Okay, so here uh, this lock state architecture is not actually protecting the memories. Okay, so the memories are protected by a different technique called uh, a segment, single error uh, correction and a little bit error detection. So that gives you basically uh, errors, in the, I mean, that gives you the fault detection uh, because of the errors in the memories. So this lock state architecture is actually a uh, 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 mechanism for detecting the faults in the processor logic. Okay, but even uh, if there's no, so if you replay a load twice, you might still get different values, though, right? I mean, even if memory is protected, just because you might have some delay, as you said, in a slave being a few cycles behind the master or something, you might just get different values because of that, and that might lead to a bunch of false positives that you might consider to be errors, even though they're not actually errors in the way you're looking. Okay, so uh, when we do this uh, context saving, so what we do is basically uh, we compare the uh, resistor contents of both the processors, okay, and when we compare it, basically we will have a, a delay uh, uh, to compensate the delay at the input, okay. So we are compensating the delay at the input with the delay at the output, okay. So, and when we have the same resistor values, then only we store that values to the memory, okay. So that's how we are having a single set of uh, resistors stored in the memory 
and that will be used for restoring the processor context when there is a fault. Hi, Sean Frankie. Uh, one question is, uh, you mentioned the flash based that today is a newer GSU. So if I didn't get cracked, uh, um, by using the flash based FPGA, it would not be lost out the processor cores. Okay, so the flash based FPGAs, uh, as I mentioned, so there are two different memory In every FPG, there are two types of memory elements. So one type, one set of memory elements are used for storing the configuration, that is routing information. Okay, another set of elements are used for your logic. So in flash based FPGAs, the routing related memory elements are susceptible to the single event offsets, uh, and not susceptible to the single event offsets. But the uh, memory elements that are used for your logic, like the resistors, right? Those are susceptible to the single event offset. So those things need to be protected, and that's where this lossy process helps you. Okay. Uh, another question is: You mentioned a lot of technologies. Um, you know, can design to uh, in order to design some uh, safety critical um, uh, modules. My question is for this five vendors, or for interesting to use this five to design into the automotive industry. Any other than any technologies are that is free to use and without paying issues. Uh, you mean uh, like hardware checkpoints? Like concept is everybody's free to uh, input and their own. Uh, okay, so I, I don't think uh, there is any payment uh, on this checkpoint. It is a very common technique uh, used by many people. I don't think there is a payment on this uh, checkpointing and rollback technique. Hi, in your talk, you mentioned that um, open source processes have some advantages for safety critical applications. Um, but I can see some challenges. So, for instance, when I buy a commercial processor core, uh, I can get some documentation of the design and verification process, which I can use in my ISO 26262 certification compliance, for instance. In an open source core, uh, you simply don't get that documentation. Right? Where do you see the um, how do, you, how do you see that being resolved? So obviously someone has to generate that information in right. terms of identifying faults and the importance of faults and verifying that those faults aren't going to have safety critical implications. But by a commercial core, I can get all that from the vendor. Right. Where do you see the burden lying in the source core? So here, uh, the risk by uh, ISC is open source, right? So the implementations are not open source. I mean, you can pick the open source implementation, but uh, you can take the open source ISA and uh, implement your processor according to the ISA, and uh, since it is, uh, you know, you have all the uh, rights to basically provide this code, code to the certification authority for inspection, I mean, uh, you need some kind of certification for the safety systems, right? So, that, I mean, that's your responsibility uh, to basically have the uh, documentation that is required for the certification, and uh, uh, I mean, you have to provide your uh, source codes to the uh, authority for inspection as well. So you see the burden line with the system integrator or that there will be core vendors for open source cores that will fit? Okay. Yeah, people provide commercial support. Yeah. You want that stuff to do it as somebody who's providing commercially. Yeah. So you use an open source query, right? Yeah. For instance, it's for the same that. It just, just happens to be using an open ISA. Yeah, I thought that would be the answer, but then, so the, 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 I, open ISA is providing benefit here, but the open source core is like not providing benefit. Okay. I think that's fine. So, have you looked at, uh, you know, in uh, high end FPGAs here, they have SCU mitigation techniques like scrubbing? Have you evaluated that in, in some of the work that you did? Yeah, so uh, if you look at SM FPGAs, uh, they do have some radiation tolerant uh, uh, great FPGAs, but they're not. Uh, uh, Radiation tolerant by the design. Okay, so what they do is basically uh, they uh, they have some kind of mechanism to uh, detect the fault, and then they apply the mitigation techniques to recover from the fault. So what they do is basically they do some kind of uh, partial reprogramming. So let's say if we have a, a, a 10k LED device, and uh, and uh, what they do is basically they identify the fault in uh, the region where the, uh, which region is having the fault, and that uh, that region will be reprogrammed by the uh, mitigation algorithms. So what I'm saying is, so they are not true uh, single uh, event upset immune devices by uh, technology. They have some mitigation techniques, but if you look at the flash based FPGAs, those FPGAs are single event upset by technology. 
So they use uh, flash uh, cells to store the configuration data and these flash cells use high voltage and it is uh, very uh, difficult for the single event offset to change the state of these flash cells. So I'm not sure I got your point. Uh, you Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 